All righty, welcome back, folks, for another one. We're talking about the true believer. Thoughts on the nature of mass movements. This is written by Eric Hoffer. Uh, interestingly, this book is fairly old. It was published in 1951, and Eric Hoffer, um, he lived from 1902 to 1983, wrote 10 books, um, and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1983, and then he passed away that year. So um, kind of a self-educated person, but a very brilliant man. And uh, his thoughts on this book, uh, on the nature of mass movements, uh, changed my life. <laughs> no, he, he, he had some really interesting things in here that truly have, have kind of changed my perspective on a variety of things. This is my second time through the book, and... Uh, I was just as astounded this time as the first time. So today I'm also joined by Ben Palis. So Ben, welcome. Thank you. Good to be with you again. Good to have you. So Ben, as always, what are your initial thoughts of this book? So I'm, I'm, I'm surprised at times, right, where books are written, you know, a period of time ago and how well they hold up. And this is this is definitely one of those. Um, so you know, written in 1951 by the longshoreman philosopher uh, Eric Hoffer, who's just an interesting guy in in his own right. His his whole life story, you know, is really really interesting. Uh, but this book definitely holds up um, about mass movements and uh, you know all about true believers and and, and what happens with these people and. You know, in, in, in kind of thinking about this, like we talked, you know, a couple minutes ago off off the air, um, you know, the period of time that he had just lived through, you know, this is kind of based on what was happening in, in, in Russia with the, the fall of the Bolsheviks and, you know, the, the, the rise of Stalin and the Communist Party, as well as, you know, in, in Germany um, with the rise of, of Hitler and the nationalism there going through World, World War II. And he writes about you know, a, a lot of that, but, you know, taking that and now 70 years later, thinking about some of the mass movements that, that have happened and you know, we'll throw out, I guess, maybe the latest one, which is, you know, Trump and the MAGA crowd. Um, all of this holds up extremely well and it doesn't seem to matter if it's, you know, just religion or nationalism, national movements. It's a heck of a book. Very interesting book. And uh, you, you kind of reminded me, I think it was on Joe Rogan the other day. I was listening to a couple guys talking and they were saying that basically religion is sort of falling apart. Right. But the new the new religion is like political parties or or social justice groups. Right. That's like the new that's the new religion, um, a determination and an allegiance to these groups, whether it's, you know, feminism, black lives matters. Now all of a sudden it's like white men are being attacked. So it's like white men, masculinity. Right. And it's like, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. It's like everyone's joining their club Antifa, the, you know, the proud boys like QAnon. There's all these weird groups that are really taking hold. And, um, that's kind of the new, <laughs> the new mass movement. Right. And, uh, at one point in the book, he, he talks about once a once a mass movement or party starts to try to sort of justify their behavior, the movement's essentially over. And so I've kind of been when I heard that, I started looking at like, OK, what are the you know movements over the last century that have sort of been strongholds and how are they behaving right now? Trying to justify behavior, trying to uh, change their rules or their, you know, social stances, things like that. And once that starts to happen, the movement's over. Talking about, uh, um, you know, past mass movements that are now starting to justify themselves, you know, and, and, and you mentioned religion um, and, and you see a lot of justification right now through different re religious organizations of them trying to, I, I guess, keep themselves relevant. And it, it seems like that they are definitely failing. Uh, if you look at you know, some of the, the, the bigger churches take, for example, the Catholic Church and, you know, all the issues that they've had through the last uh, 30 years. Uh, same with the, uh, uh, the, the LDS Church as, as well that I think we're definitely more familiar with. Um, and I think you're right. I, I think that's why you see uh, people starting to fall away from religion or uh, 
that type of, of movement and, and are now starting to become, it seems to me at least a little bit, a little bit more tribal in trying to latch on to some of these other movements and organizations that you mentioned, like, you know, whether it be BLM or Antifa or, you know, MAGA or, or whatever, whatever it is. I, I think religious organizations are kind of ripe for the picking right now. And that's one of the things that it talks about in the, in the true, the true believer that, uh, um, as one organization struggles, then people leave that and go to try to find something else. And I think that's exactly what's happening. And those are easy converts too. He explains that in the book, right? Someone who was once part of an organization or currently is, but is becoming frustrated with it is an easy convert to a new organization that's got the fanaticism that they needed, right? Um, so to kind of lay out some of the teachings of this book, in the beginning, he starts talking about kind of why a mass movement happens and who joins a mass movement. And, and I guess that kind of goes throughout the book and he hits multiple things, right? Misfits, immigrants, people like just a variety of different people throughout um, points in their life, uh, you know, college students, ex-military people, uh, a religious person that's now no longer part of that religion, um, political parties, et cetera, right? People, uh, he, he hits on all these points. But to start it out, he kind of talks about a frustrated person is looking for some thing, some person, place, organization, a hope in the future that can kind of liberate them from their frustration. And that frustration can come in many ways, right? But to name a few, like, if you were once doing well financially and you lose your job and there are no jobs around and your family is in need, that pressure and frustration mounts and gets more and more. And so if you can join a leader or a movement that will kind of liberate you from that frustration, that's, that's a likely person to join. Right. Um, and he, he kind of talks about that, like ultimate freedom is actually a fairly large burden to carry on your own shoulders, right? When you basically say like, okay, it is all up to me to make sure that I'm okay and my family is okay, that we're well taken care of, that we navigate this life with so many options and variability, threats and things and opportunities, right? To say that that is all on my shoulders is actually a, a big burden, right? Some people enjoy that, you know, other people are back and forth on that. And some people truly down deep don't want that responsibility. And so uh, that's kind of the root of mass movements. Those are people who are looking for, in a sense, a savior, right? Whether that's truly like Jesus or Hitler or Gandhi or Donald Trump in the new age or whatever, like um, somebody take hold of what's going on and, and take it in a direction that benefits me. And I can join this party and that will free me from the, the burden I feel of, you know, ultimate responsibility. So that sets the stage for the book, right? The frustrated are people that are likely to join a mass movement. Uh, and then he, he starts diving in to many little sectors and saying, this is how these people often react in this situation or this movement in this country, this revolution, right? And then it, it frequently turns to what are the kind of ideals, the rules set, how fanatical is the, the leader? Is he charismatic enough to lead them through? And um, eventually, you know, mass movements fall apart. But that's kind of a brief of, of where we begin. Yeah, I just I, I want to just add something onto that, um, and that individualism is is hard. It's it's difficult. Um, extreme ownership is is difficult, right? Um, blazing your own path, doing your own thing is is it's tough, uh, and so that's why a lot of people fall into these types of mass movements because they're looking for something else, and it is easier to become part of a group. Um, it's it's easier, I think, um, to think of uh, of self as being part of something bigger, uh, and and I think 
for some reason, it gives humans comfort in, in being able to do that. Uh, so that's why I, I really think that mass movements um, pick up so much steam and grab so many people because individualism is tough. Exactly. So he says all mass movements generate in their adherent a readiness to die and a proclivity to united action. All of them, irrespective of the doctrine they preach and the program they project, breed fanaticism, enthusiasm, fervent hope, hatred, and intolerance. All of them are capable of releasing a powerful flow of activity in certain departments of life. All of them demand blind faith and single-hearted allegiance, right? Obedience is like number one. You need to be obedient, 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 right? Um, he says that people are more willing to fight and die for a f for what they don't have, uh, you know, faith or hope in the future than for what they do have, right? So if your life is, uh, if you've already achieved many of the things you wanted, you know, it's, it's not as uh, exciting as the bright hope of a new future, the promised land. And uh, so you really got to have this idea of a, a brighter future. You need to be fanatical about it. You need to require, you know, willingness to die, absolute allegiance, and uh, lead them to this promised, promised land. It doesn't have to be logical. It just has to, has to instill hope. You know, a couple, a, a couple points there, um, you know, just in that small paragraph. And, and this book is full of those types of paragraphs that you could literally go into and, and discuss and talk about for, for hours. Um, obedience, the, the first thing, right? There, there has to be complete o obedience. Um, and and I, I, I turn and look at that through my own lens with religion. Uh, and what do many religions preach? <laughs> complete o obedience. Um, they, they demand it. Uh, and so I, I found that very, very interesting that, uh, you know, to be part of that tribe, you have to be completely obedient to the teachings and the principles of that tribe. Um, so I, I found that pretty fascinating. Speaking of those one liners or small paragraphs, I had to, I had to read this as I'm kind of going through my bookmarks and highlights. He says, this is touching on what one you just said. He says, the unemployed are more likely to follow the peddlers of hope than the handers out of relief. Right. And this comes after he says, one of the most potent attractions of a mass movement is its offering of a substitute for individual hope. Right. It's like, you just got to like feed them hope hope in a future, feed it, feed it, feed it. And people will become, they'll give everything for it. Look at like, he, he references a lot of people, right? Um, people that were willing to leave their homes. I mean, the Mormons that crossed the plains, right? They were being exterminated in what Missouri, and they basically gathered up their stuff and left and walked across the United States, many of which died all kinds of hardship, right? but they had this faith in a promised land, a brighter future, something that, that would be provided to them. And uh, there are countless examples through the book of other people doing a similar thing, giving up everything to participate in this, you know, futuristic vision versus, um, you know, sticking with what you've got, this conservative uh, view of, of what's currently at play. You know, we, we both share that same lens for sure. You know, and I, I, I think about, you know, going even a little bit further than that is that uh, with those European converts to the to the Mormon religion, right? We're on a different continent, <laughs> know nothing of America other than, well, there's there's some there's some hope over there. Um, some people come over and tell you about a new religion in a new land and you leave everything to travel across the Atlantic to a completely different country to follow some people blindly across the continent out to the deserts of, uh, of Utah. And most of your family dies along the way just for a hope of having a, a, a brighter future. Um, it's fascinating to think about what drives people to actually do that. So you're talking about people that were converted and came across the ocean, but he talks about immigrants 
being, uh, you know, a prime example of someone who's currently or, or recently kind of changed their scene, then they may want to assimilate, right? And so there's like um, an opportunity there for a new convert. Now, there's two types of immigrants, those that come and want to keep their culture and they find their culture here or wherever they go to, right? And then there's the ones that immigrate and go, I want to become American, you know, I want to be like them. And so they're ready and open to something, right? And they can easily be influenced to a mass movement. And so that ties in a bit here. He says, it is usually those whose poverty is relatively recent, the new poor, who throb with the ferment of frustration, right? So he talks about people who have been in desolate poverty for generations are unlikely to rise up in mass movement. But someone who did well or was, you know, sees future opportunity, but has been deprived of it or recently became poor, they're very likely to move. And that idea applies to multiple people. That's, you know, the, in, the immigrant, the one that lost their religion, the new educated, the one that's out on the job, uh, search for a job, right? Whether they're a college student or, or recently lost their job, uh, someone who had some tragedy in their family, whatever, right? So it's like someone who's got this new frustration, a new landscape is very, very likely to join a mass movement. So just to touch on this um, point a bit more, he says, where people toil from sunrise to sunset for a barren living, they nurse no grievance and, and no, dream no dreams. One of the reasons for the unrebellious of the masses in China is the inornate effort required there to scrape together the means of the scantiest substance. The intensified struggle for existence is a statistic rather than a dynamic influence, right? And on the bottom of the next page, he says, our frustration is greater when we have much and want more than when we have nothing and want some. <laughs> Those who see their lives as spoiled and wasted crave equality and fraternity more than they do freedom. Isn't that interesting? I, th I find that interesting here in America where, you know, we, we basically rep freedom, right? That's like our thing. We are the country that leads the, f the free world. Uh, and yet people kind of, in some sense, don't want ultimate freedom. They would rather have some sort of fraternity, some sort of uh, rule book, someone that's going to lead them and tell them they, they should willingly sacrifice their freedom and be super obedient to the rules of this organization. Yeah, I, I find that fascinating myself and, and always have. Um, and the, the curious thing to me is that what I have, what I have noticed, especially we'll, we'll say over the past, uh, maybe eight years, um, is that those who preach freedom the most, at least to me, the most, the ones who seem to be the most vocal about it are the ones who seem to be ripe for authority, authoritarianism, um, where they, they, they cry for freedom, preach freedom, wave the American flag but then we'll glom on to some sort of, of group that while they may preach freedom, their ideas and principles aren't about freedom. It's about control. If you, if you go just right underneath the surface, it's all about control and, and doing what I say while preaching about that this is the ultimate freedom. And that dichotomy has just, it's it's blown my mind and I, I i see it more and more kind of like a snowball rolling down a hill it it, it seems like um that you know the the more people drive around with an american flag maybe on you know a, a huge flag on the back of a pickup truck which we see a lot in in utah or a a, a trump 2020 flag you know and and the ones that scream about freedom are the ones that glom onto these groups that aren't about freedom at all uh, in my view, at least, they're more about authoritarianism, um, 
and you know doing what people say not having that ultimate individual individualism or that ultimate freedom you bring up the trump thing but i also have to say back when obama was running sure same thing saw like saw like the same thing right, right? and um that illustrates a point he makes in this book where the the far right and the far left are actually much more similar to one another than like the far right and the middle or far left in the middle. Right. So he says like they are much closer to each other than they realize. Right. And they are also very easy converts to the other side. Uh, so if you were a fanatical Obama nation person, uh, you would be an easy convert to become a radical right winger. Uh, and vice versa, right? And you see the same type of tribalism and willingness to forego personal right to swear allegiance to the leader or the the movement. Yeah, totally. I mean, I I, I totally see you know politicalism as as being a circle, right? It's not a straight line, right left. It's a circle, and the further you are to the right, the actual closer you are to the extreme left. I, I think a great example of that is you know watching the uh, the the Bernie Bros. Um, as as soon as you know Bernie Sanders uh, had to drop out of the presidential race, all of a sudden then they a good percentage were Trump fanatics. It's because the extreme right and the extreme extreme left are so much closer than someone who's in the middle. If you're in the middle, you hardly ever touch anyone from the right or from the left. But the right or left are so close on the extreme ends. Right. So this little blurb kind of explains what we're talking about in a way. He says, the poor who are members of a compact group, a tribe, a closely knit family, a compact racial or religious group are relatively free of frustration and hence almost immune to the appeal of a proselytizing mass movement. The less a person sees himself as an autonomous individual capable of shaping his own course and solely responsible for his station in life, the less likely he is to see his poverty as evidence of his own inferiority. <laughs> right. So politically, people get charged, right? They get freaking raging. And there's both the hope for a brighter future and hatred for the enemy. Right. And uh, when we're talking just right and left, the if you're right, the left is the enemy and vice versa. Right. And so they're the reason things are wrong and you and your party and your leader have some of the answers, right? You're going to make it, make it better. Um, and then it flip flops. Right. And so, so this like being ingrained in a party, in a group, in a religion or a movement, when you're a part of those people, it like frees you from that, um, responsibility to actually think and decide and, make things work well and go well for yourself and for others. Yeah. You know, he, he talks a lot about those, uh, what he describes as unifying agents, um, and, and hatred being that number one unifying agent. And, uh, um, just, a just a brief sentence here that, that, that really struck me is that mass movements can rise and spread without belief in a God, but never without belief in a devil. <laughs> And that is so true in any of these mass movements is that it, it seems like hatred of something it is one of those huge unifying forces that brings that group together. People are willing to really, I guess, overlook other people's faults or flaws to be united in hatred. Whereas when you're looking for friend and foe, you know, when you're looking for friends or love or whatever, uh, it's like, I guess there's just a little bit more, uh, like critical thinking saying like, well, do I want to live my life with this person or like this or whatever, but we hate together. Let's go to war. Right. Uh, there's a, there's a bit of like kind of rage driving it. Right. A little bit of, uh, willingness to take pain or go alongside someone that you don't necessarily like their character, but they're on board with the cause. So let's go to battle together. Right. So hatred is an interesting, interesting thing. 
um, I was kind of having this talk with my wife, you know, and, and she was kind of saying, well, I don't know that that is number one in all things. Right. So like take religion, we've, you know, religion's a mass movement in a lot of ways, certain re- religions. And you might say that religion is based in like love, uh, love of God, love of family, love of people, whatever. And that's certainly a massive, strong component. And I don't know if, I don't know if hatred would be stronger, but it's certainly still there, right? So in like Christianity, you define Satan as the enemy. He is the reason for all evil and he's the one we're fighting against and that, you know, we're all fallen and in, uh, we're not worthy to return to God's presence or being God, you know, whatever, however you define it. And Satan's the cause, he's the source. And so we're unified in fighting against that. However, it may be equally strong that the positive, the the love, the the bright side is is also, you know, there. It's certainly up there. I don't know if it's more powerful than hatred or not. Yeah. You know, and and and, and I would I would say in, in, in what I have seen is that uh I mean it it depends on the person for sure. And I don't know if I would say that it's 50-50, but maybe maybe fairly close, at least in what I have seen, uh, the difference between unifying love or unifying hatred in, in, in religion. But yeah, I think in religion, it's, it is, it, it's a little bit different uh, because sometimes it's, it, it's cloaked in different, in different things, right? Um, where in Christianity, at least, um, most Christianity preaches hatred of sin, right? Um, but in a lot of cases, it becomes hatred of the sinner using using my air quotes there um where people say that they hate the sin not the sinner but it becomes i i think uh a little bit different especially in modern christianity and definitely out on the fringe that people actually dislike or hate what they consider as the the sinner um you know and 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 that has taken many different views of many different peoples throughout history. Um, you know, in the book, he points out, you know, the, the hatred of the Jewish race, um, and, and that being cloaked, not only in, in religion, but also through authoritarian movements as well through that, through that period of time. Um, and, and the same, I I think could be said more modernly, if we're going to talk about modern religion, uh, with the, uh, um, you know, LGBT, Q community, um, you know, not so much as, you know, as, as the Jewish community was, you know, killed and put into <laughs> concentration camps, but I mean, for, for persecution in religion, I, I think that those could match up a little bit. Yeah. Didn't we just have a vote on that at the federal level? It was like a huge percentage of people said like voted that, you know, gay people cannot be married. Making there, there was just a, yeah, another vote in the house. Yeah, last week, um, you know, because of what the Supreme Court did around abortion rights, uh, and then you know, with Justice Thomas and several other people saying that basically that probably the next step would be to try try to take away freedom of, of marriage, um, you know, and then go from from there. Yes, there was a vote in the House, and uh, there was a, a a large percentage of one group uh, that voted against uh, codifying marriage rights into law. Wow. Interesting, man. Wild times. Oh, what I was going to add to that whole hatred thing is one thing that seems true to me is that people are quicker to action, uh, you know, take to the streets with hatred than they are for love. And I think that's part of why what we see in you know politics is that the very loud are the people that are disturbed angry hateful whereas all the others that are content with their little family doing the job they you know they need to do to make sure they're okay like they're quiet you know they don't they don't get out and take to the streets they're they're operating more from a a place of like love and security versus like the ones that are united in hatred are out there getting loud, right? Saying things on social media, going to the streets, showing up at politicians' houses and like things like that. It's like they're, they're move, they're, 
They're motivated to fight by hatred. Yeah. And, you know, we've got the the uh, the quiet majority uh, and then the vocal minority for sure. Uh, definitely in politics. OK, a couple of one liners for him here it says experience shows that production is at its best when the workers feel and act as members of a team. Right. So whether that's in business or in um, politics or religion, make, make sure people unite and work as a group. They're rewarded as a group, you know, that that keeps that team unity uh, going. It, it relieves them of personal responsibility. A rising mass movement attracts and holds a following not by its doctrine and promises, but by the refuge it offers from the anxieties, barrenness, and meaninglessness of an individual existence. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that goes back to, you know, once again with individualism. Individualism is hard. Uh, it's, it's much easier to be part of a group. When a church which was all embracing relaxes its hold, new religious movements are likely to crystallize. Again, I think we touched on this, but once a per, once a movement starts to justify its stances, relaxes a few of its uh, you know hard line rules, um, people are likely to fall away, and that's an opportunity for other mass movements to come in and scoop up all of these misfits. Right? Hitler's totalitarian regime, once established, was never in danger of mass revolt. So long as the ruling Nazi hierarchy was willing to shoulder all responsibilities and make all decisions, right? So these people were simply following the leader, following the rules, as long as they were given orders and those orders were either executed or consequences followed. As long as that structure stayed in place, the regime was never really, um, in, you know, at threat. What de Tocqueville says of tyrannical government is true of all totalitarian orders. Their moment of greatest danger is when they begin to reform. That is to say, when they begin to show liberal tendencies. So you think of, a, you know, you think of a, a religion changing their stance on like, for example, gay rights. That's a moment, that's that's a hard line for a lot of churches or religions where it's like, this is what God says. This is how it should be. So it's right or wrong based on that. If they change that ruling, suddenly a bunch of fanatics are going like, what else it is a, a, you know, a phony principle or something? And, th and that's when they fall away. That's when they start to actually speak up, get angry walk away, take others with them. Right. And now you're, you're threatening your own thing. So it's like, once they, they loosen up this stronghold, things are about to fall apart, which is why I think in America, right. When people start talking about changing the constitution or whatever, that's when people get, get wild because that's our rule book. You know, that's our thing that says, this is the way it works. Nobody should touch it. And once people start trying to touch it, it gets, it gets wild, right? Yes. Things would get really wild. Yeah. If that, if that were to actually happen, I mean, you, you hear about certain states, you know, that w would like to call a constitutional convention, right? Um, some of the, some of the right wing fanatics, you know, that we see in, 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 in the Alice fanatics in Utah and in Texas, you know, are always calling for a constitutional convention to try to change some of the constitution. Um, and it's, it's, a uh, you know, it's an, it, it, it's an interesting thought surrounding that in that, um, you know, when we, what, what I think has made America work, uh, a, a, as a country, um, and it, how it works differently from, from other countries is, you know, for example, for example, you know, Germany or Japan or, or, or Italy that has that, uh, real hegemony, right? They have culture that binds them together and, and has for hundreds, if not thousands of years, um, where America is different. America is a, a, a thought, a, an ideal, and people, including immigrants, have to buy into that thought or that ideal. But it works because many of them do assimilate and, and call themselves Americans, um, where it's not broken up, you know, by by race or or religion. 
and, and I think that's why some of that is so sacred to a lot of Americans um, in that when people start to talk about changing that, then people think, well, then America itself would completely fall apart because it's no longer that same thought or that same ideal. And, and yeah, things I think would go off the rails significantly if that happened. <laughs> yep. You, you can't change the rule book or people really, they get angry, you know, and, and start looking for uh, a change of leadership or a new movement. All right. We, we've talked at length about the frustrated joining mass movements and why they may or may not uh, want to stay in. But now let's talk a little bit about the leaders of mass movements. So he, in the book, brings up many great leaders, right? Um, both for good and evil, or or I don't know if you should classify it that way at this point, because we're talking about <laughs> mass movements of every kind. But he talks about Gandhi, Hitler, Jesus, uh, you know, presidents of, of places. Uh, some of the leaders of China and, you know, uh, Mao and some of these people, right? So um, various revolutions throughout history. He's a much better historian than I am. And he, he, he talked about a lot of events throughout history in multiple uh, places in the world. But um, for example, during the Chinese revolution, he says it would have stuck had they been able to produce a strong leader. But at that time, nobody rose to the top and therefore the revolution kind of fell apart on the other hand uh or the soviet union right had some strong leaders or or nazi germany had hitler who showed up right at the right time with the right fanaticism with um you know both solutions and enemies right and these leaders are very good at basically following the rules uh, f for a mass movement. So when Hitler was asked, do you really believe the Jews should be wiped off the face of the earth? His response was, well, no, then we would have to create a new enemy. Right. He knew he knew that the people were united in hatred, that blaming somebody for the you know, sad state of affairs was a big motivator and a good way to keep people in action on his team. And he could be, of course, their savior. He could be the one that showed up and said, here's, here's food, here's resources, you know, now turn around and go, go kill those people and take, take what they have. Right. I mean, he, he had a really strong uh, set of rules that he was following and, and he was that charismatic leader that was fanatical and, and, you know, worth following. And uh, others did the same, right? Uh, and so he, he talks about those leaders at length in this book and, and some of their attributes. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll just mention a couple things. So, um, you know, one of the other podcasts that I really love to listen to is, uh, is Hardcore History. And uh, he's got a great segment or, or series on, uh, on, on Japan um, and the, the lead up and then through World War II. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's like 24 total hours um, going through that, but talking about how um, the Japanese completely changed their culture in a, a such a, a short period of time to become this great superpower and the leaders that, that did that and how they bastardized not only their culture, but their religion to, to bring the entire Japanese people together to become who they were during the, the, the 30s and 40s. And it's, it's, it's really a fascinating delve into kind of this, these same types of, of, of principles that what leaders or movements do to radicalize enough people to, to bring that movement to the forefront and then try to accomplish its, its goals. And it's, it's really rather fascinating. Um, you know, same thing, thinking about what uh, Stalin did with the Bolsheviks, um, you know, and the rise of the, the, the Soviets and then the, and then the USSR, you know, the same with, uh, with Hitler, um, and the authoritarian movement in, in Germany. And the whole thing to me is just, it's, it's fascinating what these leaders are able to do with these types of, of mass movements. 
they have all these certain characteristics, right? They're, they're charismatic, they're powerful, they're fanatical, they are excellent with spoken and written word, and uh, they understand that action and hatred are major unifiers, right? And so they, they instill these things into the people that, that follow them. He, he says here that the, uh, the frustrated follow a leader less because of their faith that he is leading them to a promised land than because of their immediate feeling that he is leading them away from their unwanted selves. Surrender to a leader is not a means to an end, but a fulfillment, right? It's like this inherent um, satisfaction in that, like, he's taken responsibility for me. And so when, when you have that leader show up, in that way, I just describe people go, ah, oh, like, oh, this feels better. Like he's, he's got it under control. I'll just join the tribe and I'm good to go. Right. Just do what he says. And it's easier. Yeah. It reminds me of something that, uh, a, a, a politician, a most re one of our most recent politicians preached, uh, is that only I can do this. <laughs> Only I can save us. Only I can do this. And it's along those same, same veins of thought. Is that just, in, you know, just give up your, your, your freedom to me and I will make everything better for all of you. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I mean, truly, that's what people are looking for in, in, you know, as far as he's talking about in these mass movements. Take me, take me somewhere else. Don't just leave me here, right? So. One of the chapters is called Men of Words, and he, he speaks at length that, you know, how these people are kind of accepted by the general population as somebody who's excellent at, at uh, you know, speaking, motivating, moving people. He says, uh, the preliminary work of undermining existing institutions, of familiarizing the masses with the idea of change, and of creating a receptivity to a new faith can be done only by men who are first and foremost talkers or writers and are recognized as such by all. Right. So they, they're introducing ideas that should not be talked about by the former mass movement. Right. To say that this leader is wrong, that these this rule book of laws or uh, the, you know, the code of obedience or the way we view a certain population of people to say that that's wrong. And here's the new solution. You got to be bold. You got to be brave. But you also need to have some some ability to really uh, convince people, shape their ideas. And so that's what these leaders had the ability to do. He also talks about that most mass movements did not begin with the leader who actually kind of carries it out. But the stage was being set by others. And then they showed up at the right time. Right. I already mentioned the whole thing with the Chinese revolution that they, they failed to produce a leader, but other revolutions had that leader show up right at that exact moment. You know, I think we saw a little bit of that with the Donald Trump thing where um, most like a lot of people that I talk to today, they don't want to claim Republican or Dem Democrat. The waters are too muddy. Right. It's just disgusting. Like. Like the politics is a dirty game. It seems like so many people that get into the game are kind of dirty too. Or the ones that didn't seem dirty and stayed too long. Now all of a sudden it's just, you know, it's like ties everywhere, money everywhere, like bad decisions being made, money being thrown all over the place. Um, and so it, it just kind of makes you go like, man, I don't want to be associated with either side. Well, that stage had been set. And then Donald Trump, who all the way 20 years ago said if he ever did run for president, he would drain the swamp. And then, of course, you know, he runs for presidency and he's talking about draining the swamp. He's a non-politician. He's a self-made billionaire. Like it, it was that leader that showed up when the stage had already been primed. He says in the book, again, there's, a, there's another section, he says, Leaders need to be able to find out where the people are going so that they can go to the front and lead them. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so it's not necessarily somebody who is coming up with creative new ideas, but willing to be the face, the voice, the motivator, the you know one that defines certain rules and puts it in place. So a couple things there that you were talking that 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 struck me and uh, gave me a, a few more thoughts around this. So in the book, when he's talking about that, uh, these leaders of mass movements have to be uh, a, a typically a great speaker and a great writer. Um, and and I, I think about some some things with that. Um, if you think about some of the presidents that that we've had that are considered, I guess, good, good leaders or really helped develop some mass movements. Um, you know, Barack Obama comes to the forefront of my mind because, you know, in the last uh, in the last 20 years, for sure, um, I think he created the the biggest following um, from being a very just outstanding speaker. He's a good writer as well. But as a, a as a speaker um, in prepared speeches, I, I thought was one of the greatest that uh, probably one of the greatest American presidents when it came to speaking. And he was able to get a lot of people to follow him or to believe in his movement because of that. Other, another one that I think of is Reagan, um, you know, leading up to his presidency and then the first couple of years uh, of his presidency of, of being able to give um, some of the most phenomenal speeches that that we've ever heard, you know, definitely in, in my lifetime. Another one, of course, Abraham Lincoln, right? Just a, a tremendously skilled orator. Um, being able to give you know speeches and writings that that last not only generations but hundreds of of years now um and then it, that caused me to think about a couple things where okay we've had some some in the political sphere or even in in, in religion some very dynamic individuals who are able to uh, uh speak very very clearly and get people to follow them right are very exciting but as an actual leader, I think they fail a lot of times. And that's when these mass movements, I, I think, fall apart a bit um, because they're very dynamic speakers uh, or, or are great writers, um, but aren't able to follow through in some genuine leadership capabilities to take people maybe to a better place. And, and I think when we get these individuals throughout history, whether they be good or bad, you know, subjectively, but but good or bad, they're the type of person, though, that can can be a, a great leader or have that call to action to get people to actually move. And, and that's why I think that they're so rare, because we get a lot of people who can, you know, talk or write. But when it comes to leadership, it falls apart. And I think it's that rare individual, good or bad, that can bring that leadership capability into it to actually lead a, a mass movement and take humanity somewhere. You know, that's interesting. As you're talking about this, I'm I'm kind of rerunning Donald Trump's uh, ascent and descent. As I mentioned before, he had many qualities that primed him to be the leader that took on this group of, of frustrated people, right? And it said, like, I don't want a politician. I want someone outside of the swamp. He came in claiming to drain the swamp and all this stuff. And he had, you know, he had a lot of that, but my personal opinion, he acted like a buffoon. He was hard for me to want to follow because he was cr radically crazy. He would, he would attack the small people. He would try and belittle people that he, sh he had no business even giving a second thought to what they tweeted about him or, or whatever. Right. And, and instead of acting like a strong president, he acted like a, a wounded bully, you know, and it was like, OK, so then he to me, he lacked that leadership that you're talking about. Right. He had many of the qualities leading up to it, but he failed in his ultimate leadership ability to take that, uh, you know, take the population that was frustrated and lead them. He instead incited a lot more frustration. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right? And, you know, I, I, I think about that and, you know, we could sit here all day and talk about different, different movements and leaders because it is so fascinating. And, it, you know, because, I mean, you know, Trump and that movement uh, is, is so right now, I, I, I think it deserves a couple minutes for sure. Um, but I look at, okay, 
you know, the frustration, especially through the through the Rust Belt of America, right, where things are falling apart. We're no longer manufacturing things in America. Cities and towns uh, throughout the Midwest, you know, are, 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 are not going in the best direction. He was able to able to capitalize on that at that time, because, like you said, the story surrounding Donald Trump, you know, is that he, he was a self-made billionaire, right? He could change it. He could help the economy, whether or not that was true or not. I have my own beliefs on that, but whether or not that was true or not, that's what was presented and people grabbed onto it. But then I think you're exactly right, right? He was able to create a, a movement, um, but then the curtain was drawn back and you saw who Oz actually was and he was a buffoon and a leader in the clown car and that's when everything fell apart once again my personal beliefs <laughs> oh, that's so good well i would say that it, it probably depends on the things that most frustrate you because donald trump truly did he, he i would say he has a far better handle on economics and business than like obama did Obama's a lot of Obama's policies were detrimental to American economy and Trump was the opposite. But Obama, you could handle to hear him talk and Trump, you were like, oh, turn off the TV, you know? <laughs> right. And so it's like, what frustrates you? Is it the economics or are you a social justice warrior? Right. Depending on where you land on that is going to determine whether you're going to still follow him or not. Um, I also had to say, when you were saying he's not the greatest writer or speaker, you must not have been talking about comedy because he was he's, absolutely he was the funniest people. president we've <laughs> ever had. <laughs> he had some good you jokes. Know, he, he kept oh, a lot of, yeah, he kept a lot cuff. of comedians in business for, uh, for a six year period as well. So <laughs> I, I'll agree with you completely on that. <laughs> he's so funny. He's the funniest president we've ever had. Um, anyway, all right. I'm just going to point out a couple more things here at the end of the book that I found interesting. This is under good and bad mass movements. He says, now it seems to be true that no matter how noble the original purpose of a movement and however beneficent the end result, its active phase is bound to strike as unpleasant, if not evil. Now, he talks about in many phases, right? Even Jesus sort of said, like, come follow me, right? Don't don't like when, who was it? Peter, Paul, whoever said, you know, can I go bury my father? And he says, let the dead bury their dead. Focus on me, right? Whomsoever turns to their mother or father before me is not worthy of me, right? It's like, have an eye single to my glory kind of thing, right? Saying like, you must change the way you thought about this or the way you interacted with these people or that group or that political party or whatever and change the way you're, you have been living and this is the new order. And it will inevitably come off as the new evil, right? This is the new evil. This is the uh, one sent by Satan to destroy it all, right? And uh, eventually it it might shift. Whether good or evil, it will initially feel that way. And I think we see that a lot in politics. The The idea that what we have going is is better than the future versus what the future could bring is better than what's currently at play. Uh there's a certain amount of fear and anxiety around change or the lack of change, depending on where you sit. Right. All right. And the last thing that I want to read, he says, JBS Halden counts fanaticism among the only four really important inventions made between 3000 BC and 1400 AD. It was a Judaic Judaic Christian invention and it is strange to think that in receiving this malady of the soul in the world also received a miraculous instrument for raising societies and nations from the dead and an instrument of resurrection. It's interesting. He calls it an invention. 
<laughs> one of the most significant in all that time, clear back from 3000 BC. And yet uh, we see it everywhere now. We're a society of tribalism, right? Uh, it's almost like we've become so d disconnected from society as we knew it when it was, you know, farmers and uh, manufacturers. I mean, this is recent past uh, where the tech age, information age has sort of separated us physically from those, you know, out working together, working in groups, physical labor. We're all sitting in our houses clicking away on computers and writing nasty posts on people's, you know, comments on people's posts. And uh, so now we're suddenly trying to find where we fit. Religions are falling apart. So people are go looking for a new cause, a new leader, a new tribe to be a part of. Um, there's more kind of opportunity than ever, which also creates more frustration than ever, right? Uh, you can join any number of causes purposes there's money in it there's people behind it there's uh justice and injustice to be to be pointed out and worked on and everything and so it's like it's escalating and and then on top of that if you watched my video a week or two ago about why the u.s economy will collapse i think a lot of people are starting to feel the the pressure of uh you know a new great depression upon us and the stage is primed for some real revolution. I mean, some serious revolution, not just, you know, the, the fall of a, a club, but that certain nations may be at war with each other. I mean, it's already kind of started with Russia, but um, the stage is set, you know, so there's a lot going on right now that could really change the tide for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly where, um, I think America and the world as a whole is 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 ripe uh, for for a new mass movement of whatever that may be. I, I don't know. Um, you know, I I think a lot of the things that we've laid out today kind of show that all these different uh, groups and tribalism tribalism are seeming to grow more and more. Uh, a lot of the institutions that we've had around for the past you know one to three hundred years, many many of them are are falling apart or if not falling apart, at least, you know, there's, there's chinks in the armor or, or the, the, the concrete is starting to fall apart at the foundation that, at a lot of these institutions. Um, and I just think, you know, like you said, with the economics of what happened through COVID with the tech revolution, people no longer in, in offices or in, you know, large groups t together with, with common beliefs, as we become more and more tribal here in America, I, I think we're right for a new mass movement, whether that's, you know, uh, something that leads to good or bad remains to be seen. But I think we're definitely in for some some turmoil <laughs> over the next, uh, you know, one to two decades, I, I think, depending how things sort themselves out. But um, I, I would recommend everybody to 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 go and pick up this this book, The True Believer. Give it a read. I, I think it's a great philosophical read. Um, helps you to dive into maybe some things that we've seen uh, over the last you know ten to fifty years, and think about why things are today the way they are, and where that could lead to the future. So I thought it was a fantastic read. Um, something that I would wholeheartedly recommend to everybody to, to, to really think and dive about where things may go in the future and, and maybe what, what side you want to fall on. I love this book. As I said in the beginning, it's my second time through it. Um, very impactful. I think it's super insightful. I believe I heard this recommended by Jordan Peterson along with Ordinary Men, which I also bought and tried to read, but found it too disturbing and didn't complete it. But Ordinary Men is essentially how the Nazis managed to take ordinary men and turn them into Nazis, have them go kill an entire village or whatever uh, at someone's command, right? And uh, the reason those two books are so needed, I think, especially at a time right now that, that the stage is primed. A lot of people are leaving the church. I hear that phrase thrown around a lot, meaning basically all Christian religions in America, at least, are 
losing members quickly. Um, the financial state of the the world is in turmoil right now. We're at a lot of breaking points right now. And so mass movements of every kind could be on the table. And you don't want to be an ordinary man that joined the Nazi movement, right? And so uh, it's interesting to at least have some some uh, insight on what other people who have, you know, lived through world wars and seen what's what's gone on, right? Eric Hoffer, again, born in 1902. I mean, this guy saw some of the some of the major movements over the the last you know century and a half. So um, it's a a good read, high quality for, or it's definitely a high quality book, but it's a good read for your own insight, so that you can kind of sit back and say, "Am I shedding the burden of my social, my personal responsibility to some leader, some mass movement, something, or you know, should I be?" taking a look at that saying, what is actually mine? What do I really want from my life? And how, how can I take that responsibility and make it what I want? Yeah. And I'll just, I'll, I'll say one other thing, Bronson, um, that, that I think I got out of this, that, um, you know, it struck me in the book, but through talking through this, um, and, and that is once again, on, on rugged individualism, um, you know, and, and what we talk about often, not only in this podcast, but also in readings that, that, that we do in different conversations, is that having having a leader is is fantastic. It can be phenomenal, but be very careful on, on who you follow and do not lose your individualism. Um, do not lose the extreme ownership that I hope that all of us are putting into our lives, right? do not give that power to a leader, no matter who they are, you know, think for yourself, act for yourself, accept that responsibility of those actions for, for, for good and bad. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just think that, uh, all of us need to be careful over the next few years going, going forward, that we don't try to give that up to some sort of mass movement that may or may not happen in the country. Awesome, Ben. Well, thanks for joining me today. You guys will put the link in the show notes as always. This is True Believer, Thoughts on the Nature of Mass Movements, written by Eric Hoffer, an excellent book. Also, we're starting to uh, accumulate some emails. We're going to start this book club. So we want to uh, integrate you know, some of your ideas and some of the people out there into to the podcast. You can read along. We'll send out a book list. You can purchase the books. and um, start inter interacting and engaging uh, with us and the community around the books we're reading. So go over to bronsonwilkes.com and sign up for the email list there. Join the book club and uh, hope to see you guys over there. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the next one.